In this video, I'm going to take you and an ST on a journey from minty fresh out of the box state to an optimized powerhouse ready for productivity. How are we going to do this? Let's take a short blast over how TOS hangs together. So the VDI is the lowest level of the graphics stack in GEM. It handles primitive operations like drawing lines, shapes, fills, fonts, and text. In turn, the VDI is used by GDOS, which manages fonts and renders to different devices like the screen, printers, and metafiles. And on top of that is AAES, which renders GEM interface components like windows, buttons, scroll bars, and more. And finally, on top of all that is the desktop, which renders the UI and allows you to explore the file system and launch applications and do much, much more. All of those components can be replaced or tweaked and improved until you end up with a better, faster ST. I'm starting with GDOS, the least sexiest of things when supercharging your ST, but a vital component nonetheless. Upgrading or replacing GDOS isn't about speed. It's about features and flexibility. So my GDOS replacement of choice has always been Speedo GDOS, the speed part of the name being mostly a marketing gimmick, frankly. GDOS replacements in general, and Speedo in particular, offer things like more fonts, better driver support for more printers, outline fonts, and font caching. Fonts in GDOS were originally bitmap fonts. If you wanted multiple sizes of a font, you had two choices. Either install more bitmap fonts for each size you want, or let GDOS scale the bitmap font to different resolutions. So the first approach ate up RAM, and the second approach led to poor quality output. Outline fonts store the definition of the font face in a vector format, and Speedo GDOS can render fonts at different sizes via the vector definition and produce clean output at insane sizes, frankly. So Speedo GDOS has two font caches, one for outline fonts and one for bitmap fonts, which are still supported. But these caches are not used for increasing speed, but for reducing memory consumption. The caches operate by storing fonts red from disk for later reuse. But when the cache is full, the least recently used font is discarded and the new one loaded. This contrasts the original GDOS, where once a font was loaded into memory, it was pinned there and never released. As a final little handy dandy hint, if you like. Annoyingly, by default, GDOS waits for a key press on every boot. And if you want to get rid of that, if you go onto your C drive and edit the file extend.sys and change the line stop equals one to stop equals zero, you can boot straight into the desktop without having to press a key. The best VDI accelerator, in my opinion, is NVDI, and it's better by a long chalk than most of the rest. I'm going to show you the value of NVDI rather than tell. Performance is the most important thing, so let's look at that. So I'm going to start with NVDI not installed and run Gembench. I'm doing this on a real ST for reliability. I'm probably just going to read out, edit out most of the run as it gets a bit flashy, and I really don't want to trigger anybody. When I run Gembench, the option I'm picking is save defaults. So it will run the tests and save those results as the baseline for the future comparison. I mean, installing NVDI is a breeze. It's mostly just next, next, next. I'm showing you this on Hatari because I already have it installed on my machine. And since we're using Speed or GDOS, it's important that you disable NVDI's own GDOS support in the control panel because otherwise problems will occur. Post installation of NVDI 2.5, we're going to run the tests again. If you look at the reference in the system boxes on the bottom right of Gembench, you'll see that the only difference between the two configurations is the presence of NVDI. So let's run the tests. If we exclude the tests that NVDI can't affect, like ROM or RAM access, what we see here is a pretty startling difference. So first things first, smaller bars are better. NVDI is in green and the baseline figures in blue. As a percentage of the baseline speed, what we get is 321% over baseline for GEM dialog boxes, 965 for VDI, 806 for text effects, 596 for small text, 282% on VDI graphics, 186% on GEM windows, blitting is 175% of baseline, VDI scroll is 429%, justified text 251%, and VDI in quiet is 207%. That's an amazing improvement for some software. I mean, the key takeaway here is if you install nothing else in this guide, get NVDI. Now that we've made it go faster, let's make it look better and have more features. There were several desktop replacements for the ST over time. I used Gemini, Teradesk, and Neodesk. The one that I settled on was Neodesk. Neodesk is available from the GribNIF website. It was released into the public domain by the original author a couple of years ago. There's a link in the description to that site at the end. Installing Neodesk is simple. We select our C drive as the drive that hosts our auto folder. We select the C drive again as the drive that hosts our accessory files. 
and then we OK on through the wizard. We're going to opt to install the near desk control panel and then choose not to install the printer queue. Finally, we choose to install the recoverable trash can. You get this kind of weird warning about reading page 135 of the manual. Well, that's not on the website, so best of luck with that. Finally, I hit quit and it's installed. So after a reboot, and I think it didn't start. We'll start it manually for now and we'll get it auto starting when we look at Geneva later. In the NeoDesk menu, there are two items of interest. The Neo control panel allows us to configure the environment. So that's things like change date formats, enable or disable the screensaver, disable the dreaded keyboard beep and the alarm bell. It offers most of the functionality of X control actually without the need for CPX files. So I do run with this. And the other item in that menu is the trash can control panel. But I'm probably going to leave that for a future video because frankly, it's beyond the scope of this one. Let's have a look at the desktop, where to start. We're going to open Drive Up and we're going to see what UI toys we get. So from the get-go, you can see that there are some easy to spot differences. There's no horizontal scroll bar on the directory window. I mean, that's so much better than the TOS default where you had to scroll horizontally to find icons and it made it very difficult to uh, select all the files in a folder. On the bottom of the window, where the old horizontal scroll bar was, there are three buttons. The first button duplicates the current window with the full path. Now, this is useful if you're deeper in your file system and you want to sort of fork your navigation in two different directions. The second button switches the window mode from icon to text and back again. And finally, the third button is a select all, deselect all toggle. The final window decoration that I want to point out is the left arrow next to the full screen button. This brings the next window in rotation to the front of the screen and focuses it. Let's see what you can do inside of the file menu. Notice that the file explorer window itself has menus inside of it. And these are a combination of both more global items from the main Neo desk menu and ones that are window specific. The file menu offers you the usual toss fare and two options relating to groups. Groups are an interesting feature that are collections of items that you literally just want to group together. They're presented as a virtual folder. So I'm going to create a group and put some things into it. From the file menu, we select a new group. We enter a file name, a window name, and a description. So I'm going to put two random files into it from different locations and then save the group. Now, when we reopen our group, we'll see the stuff that we put in there. Notice that clicking on a file in the group shows the path to where the file is in the first row of the window. So there's another way to create a group, just to do it via search. Now, the search mechanism in NeoDesk is very flexible. So from the file menu, I'm just going to select search. And you know, you can search by size, date, and other attributes, but we want to use templates. And templates are, in modern terminology, wildcards. Make sure that the checkbox for the group option is selected and that templates obviously are selected too. And here I'm selecting star.prg, TOS, and ACC. And there's a button there that says freeform that allows you to specify any mask you want to. Click OK, and the new group is automatically created with the search results. When you close the window, it'll ask you if you want to save. And the saving procedure is the same as it was when we created a group before. So this has created a static group. So if files are added later that would match the original search results, the content of the group is not updated. Double clicking on an item in a group that has been deleted in the meantime just results in a warning dialogue telling you that it's not there anymore. Let's turn our attention to the view menu. The view menu contains entries that affect the current window. So let's switch to showing files as text. Notice that the other window is not affected. So each window can have its own view options, which contrasts with TOS, where all the windows would have the same. I'm just going to resize my window and look at some text mode options. We can choose to display more data by using a smaller font. And we can choose what attributes are shown by enabling and disabling them. To get even more information on the screen, we can actually opt to see more than one column of files. Similarly to groups, we can filter the shown files in either the current folder or the current folder and all subfolders that you access in that window. The sort menu does pretty much exactly what you think. You can sort by name, date, type, and no sort. No sort shows files in the order they were added to the folder. Now, there's a final option called reorder files, and this is incredibly useful when you're dealing with your auto folder. So files in the auto folder are executed at startup, and they're executed in the order that they were added to the auto folder. If you needed to reorder the files in vanilla TOS, you had to move all the files out of the auto folder and then re-add them one at a time in the order that you wanted them to run. The reorder option in NeoDesk allows you to drag and drop the files in place into the order that you want. When you turn off reorder mode, it'll prompt you to ask if you want to save or cancel. What's the performance benefits or overheads of using NeoDesk? So using the previous benchmarks of NVDI plus TOS as a baseline and running the tests from NeoDesk, we get, well, there's a 1% reduction in performance across the board with two tests coming in at worse than that at 97% of baseline. The 1% is just something I seem to see in Gembench from run to run. I think that is just the margin of error of some of the 
some of the tests. However, two of them are operating at 3% less than they should do. So these two tests are the GEM dialog box and the VDI inquire. I presume that the dialog box degradation is due to the overheads of rendering the extra decorations on window bars and dialogues and stuff. The VDI inquire, I'm not 100% sure why that came around. All in all, not significant. Okay, so we've come a long way on our journey to supercharge our ST. And the final step is going to be to get the system multitasking. While we're installing Geneva, which is our multitasking system, let's talk a bit about what multitasking is. So there are two types of multitasking. There's preemptive and cooperative. In preemptive multitasking, the OS schedules and swaps processes and tasks on interrupts at regular intervals. Cooperative multitasking is where apps give up or offer to give up execution when they choose to. Geneva is classed as a cooperative multitasking operating system. Tasks are potentially scheduled when the current app makes a call to any AES function. Obviously, if it doesn't make any calls to AES function, if it's in a tight loop, for example, then it'll never get scheduled off and it'll hog the processor, just like a standard gem app. When you consider, I think, that most productivity apps spend you know, around 90% of their time waiting for a key to be pressed or a mouse to be clicked, cooperative multitasking like this is, I think, perfectly fine. However, if you run apps like Cubase that have hard real-time requirements, I probably would give Geneva a miss. Okay, so the installation was fairly simple. The install wizard is comprehensive in its descriptions. And the only two things to note is that the path to the Geneva folder may not contain the word Geneva in it. Seems more like a bug than something you should have to be warned about. And I chose not to install the set mouse program. And I don't really know why. So you probably should. Once we've rebooted, we're back into the desktop and straight into NeoDesk. So notice that's fixed the NeoDesk boot problem. The only apparent change is that the mouse pointer now has a drop shadow. So, so what has changed? Geneva, first and foremost, is an AES replacement. So apart from multitasking, there are some visually significant changes in the way things work. The desktop menus now operate in a different manner, a pull-down way, I guess they call it. So you click, and that drops the menu down, and then you move over it and release to select a mouse item. And if you move off the menu and release, that'll clear the menu. So you don't have this annoying behavior that you used to have on the ST, where every time your mouse floated to the top of the window, menus kept popping up. Opening a window, we see that the window has decorations like title bars and scroll bars that are rendered in a 3D embossed style. Now, neither the menu changes or the visual changes are necessarily my cup of tea, but once you use it, they're fine. And there are a plethora of options in Geneva and in NeoDesk to change the way things look. So I guess the big change really is the multitasking itself. So shall we multitask? The first thing I'm going to do is configure NeoDesk not to unload itself when it launches an app. Otherwise, what you would see is when you launch an app, NeoDesk would sort of disappear, run the app, and then reload itself. It's it's a, not a pretty experience. It's certainly not what you would call fluid. So in the file settings for NeoDesk, we're going to turn the unload option off. There we go. So I'm going to run a gratuitous piece of eye candy and a calculator. Oh, multitasking at its best. Notice that as I close down the windows, that we lost the menu bar for landmine. I mean, no worries, we can access the menus of running apps via the system menu. So clicking the system menu drops down a list where you can select which application to show the desktop menu for. So here, where I, when I click the landmine app, its menu is brought to the front and we can start a new game. Eh, not a bad start for once either. One of the multitasking features that Geneva supports is putting apps to sleep. This stops the program executing and hides its window. And at this point, the app is consuming memory still, but it's not consuming any CPU. Now, according to the Geneva help file, there are no less than five different ways of putting an app to sleep. So here I'm just using the key combination control, Alt, Z. As you can see, the app window disappears. If we go to the system menu, we can see the application name is now in italics, and that means it's asleep. So clicking on the sleeping app wakes it up. I mentioned the help system when we were talking about five different ways to sleep an app. Geneva and NeoDesk have really, really good help systems. To access the help for Geneva, you select Geneva from the system menu, go to options and then help. And then a final little Geneva thing is Geneva supports tear off menus. So if you control drag any menu, it allows you to pin it to the desktop. For me, this is particularly useful with the system menu. It gives you fast access to all running apps. It's a little bit like a task monitor. So far in our journey, in terms of features and speed, it's all been pretty much upside. So the question here is, and I'm thinking you might guess what's coming, is there a negative impact on performance when introducing multitasking? I'm going to use the previous benchmark with NVDI and NeoDesk running as a baseline, and then I'm going to compare it with those two and Geneva installed at the same time. And remember, 
Smaller lines are better. Notice on this graph, there are three tests here. The first test is the NVDI plus NeoDesk baseline. And the other two are two runs of the, the test with Geneva enabled using a slightly different approach. It's pretty obvious that something really quite bad is going on here in a way. And there are three significant tests where introducing Geneva led to performance issues. So these are the gem dialog box tests where with Geneva, it performed at 56 to 62% of baseline. Gem window tests where it was 29 to 66% of baseline and VD inquire where it was 89% of baseline in all cases. I have a feeling VDI inquiries because that's the preemptive point where it decides to swap processes. Looking at the difference between the two test runs with Geneva on might let us guess what's going on. In the worst performing test, I'd run the gem bench from a directory and the window for that directory was still open underneath the test window. When running for tests for the second time, I ran it from a shortcut on the desktop, so there was only the desktop underneath it. When you run the baseline tests, which you run in a full screen toss up, there's just a repeated pattern underneath the window. So taking the worst result, which was the gem window tests, what appears to happen in the baseline test is that the window is opened, closed, and the fill pattern is redrawn. In the case where gem bench is run from the desktop, the whole desktop needs to be reordered, and re rendered rather, after the test. And finally, the worst of the worst cases, there was a desktop and a directory to re render. So there are costs to multitasking. At the end of the day, you can either run with Geneva or without it. Personally, I run with it. I think the benefits outweigh the drawbacks. Final benchmark, I promise. Comparing our original unmodified ST with the second test where everything was installed, we've still got a system better than it was at the start in all metrics. I mean, there you go. Our ST has gone from zero to hero via four pieces of software. If you want a more advanced walkthrough of some of the features of Geneva and NeoDesk, just let me know in the comments. But this video is running long enough as it is, so that's all for now. Thanks for watching, and I'll talk to you soon.